Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, trends and opinions from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening I'm joined by Jeff Utch. He's an EVP at Compact for America, and he's going to be talking about ways that we can take control back of our country. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Chris. So, are you a control freak? Why is it that you, uh, I mean, what's your background? How did you get involved with Compact for America? Sure. My background, my actually uh, degree is in engineering. But my love of history has been ever since I was a little kid, you know, raised in Richmond, Virginia, surrounded by a lot of history, and just really got into it from a young age. High school had a great government teacher and been studying the Federalist, Anti-Federalist Papers, Constitutions, really, since a young man, um, and, and just followed it my whole life. And then you saw that we weren't necessarily guiding the country according to those founding documents and principles? or Absolutely. Even in high school, when I was reading some of these documents, and it said, this is how government should be working, you know, the Federalist Papers in particular. And, you know, what, what should govern us most is what's closest to us. And we only delegated certain powers to the federal government. When I read that as a 17-year-old, even in high school, I was like, wow, something's out of whack here. Right. And even at that age, started researching, okay, well, what did the founders give us to help remedy if things started getting out of control in Washington? So you start asking these kinds of questions, and now they don't let kids read that stuff anymore because <laughs> that would screw up yeah, everything. That would, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You have to go to the original documents and get your kids to as well. Right. So, so where does Compact for America come into the picture? Has that been a relatively recent thing for you? Have you been with them for a while? And tell us a little bit about what they do and what they're about. Absolutely. Well, even way back, I looked into what remedies did the founders give us, and Article 5 of the Constitution is one of them. If you go back and study uh, the ratification debates, even the Constitutional Convention itself, uh, there were arguments about, well, what if the federal government gets out of control? Well, one of the tools that they gave us was Article 5, and actually that's what the Federalists argued to the Anti-Federalists. Look, guys, even if you're right, Anti-Federalists, and we are putting too much energy into the federal government and you think there's going to be a runaway, we've given you the power through the states to call a convention to propose amendments right. to rein in that federal government through experience. So I've been preaching this for years and years and uh, really until Mark Levin's book came out about a year and a half ago called The Liberty Amendments, not a lot of people really understood that. Uh, go teaching that in Arizona, I went to the Goldwater Institute uh, a few years back and found out that they had taken Article 5 and taken it really to what I consider the next level. Because there's so many questions that scholars, conservatives, and, and even liberals have on, well, how would a convention work? Because we've never had one before. Right. Um, we've, there's been threats of it, uh, of having a convention, but Congress itself uh, has preempted the states from calling a convention by going ahead and getting some amendments through and, and pushed through to the states. Right. And so in, in meeting with Goldwater, they said, look, we've, we've come up with a way, and Nick Dronius particularly there, uh, the attorney there, and got an idea from Ted Cruz out of uh, Texas to say, look, we can use a compact that, and, and a compact is really just a contract among sovereigns. And every state in the union now is a party to at least 20 compacts. So this is not something that's new. The Constitution itself is a compact amongst the states. But what they were saying is, look, if we can help get a convention together, if we decide ahead of time who the delegates are going to be, what the purpose is for, how long it's going to last, what the rules are, and this will help alleviate a lot of the concerns that people are having about, hey, we've never done this before and this is what we want to do. But why even talk about these kinds of things? I mean, that's only for runaway government, and our government's not <laughs> running anywhere. What proof do you have <laughs> yeah, right, sure. that, that uh, government's out of control? I mean, what were some of the symptoms that, that the founders were concerned about that would make them put this into to play in the first place, from your perspective? Sure. Well, you know, I'll just go to the uh, 17th Federalist. I'll quote that. And, and this is what I was reading when I was a young man. And Hamilton was saying, and, and I'm paraphrasing it now, he goes, look, anti-Federalists, we're giving the federal government enough power that even the most ardent tyrant will be satiated. Uh, you know, we're giving them the power to declare war, coin money, appoint ambassadors, you know, and do all these things. They're never going to want to get involved in our agriculture education, 
and domestic affairs. Now, when you read that, even when Reagan was president 30 years ago, what's going through my mind in Mr. Dugan's government class? Holy cow, we're all, and where have we gone in the last 30 years, right. of course? So um, we can see that Hamilton, in this case, uh, the Anti-Federalists had a point, you know? Uh, Richard Henry Lee, Patrick Henry, uh, George Mason, these guys were not idiots. They were, they were smart guys, and they understood what the tendency of past governments were into centralization there. Right. And, and so this is something that the founders expected us to use. And even in the Federalist Papers, that's how Hamilton ended off. Uh, use Article 5 where the states can call a convention to help reign in the federal government. And so, it, you know, you're talking about runaway government, um, and, and people worried about maybe calling in a convention and get it, it getting out of hand. Well, what about Congress sitting now? I mean, if you want to talk about a convention or a constitutional convention, which this would be different, it would just be a convention to propose amendments, but we have one sitting right now, don't we? Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're worried about that, that's already happening. Right. And we need to find ways to rein that in. Well, and that's proof that government can get out of control if enough people sit there long. <laughs> exactly. It'll fall apart. So, so talk to me about what you're trying to do. I mean, we've talked a little bit before the show, we were talking about one of sure. your major initiatives is to go ahead and, and propose a balanced budget amendment process uh, for uh, the states to get behind. Um, talk Absolutely. to us a little bit about how that works and the ramifications. Well, sure. Well, you know, in 1798, first Jefferson said if he could propose, and this is after the Bill of Rights, he said, if I could propose one more amendment that he would rely on that alone to safeguard the limited government and the powers that we gave to the federal government, and that would be to limit the ability for the federal government to borrow money. So we have Jefferson on our side, okay? We also have uh, a letter from Ronald Reagan in, from 1994. Uh, to a friend I met in the, in the Liberty uh, Freedom Fest in Las Vegas this year, uh, Lou Euler. And he had a, a, a letter from Reagan that basically said, you're right, Lou, we're never going to get the federal government to rein itself in. Luckily, the founders foresaw this and gave us Article 5, so we're going to have to go to the states to pass this balanced budget amendment. And they were specifically talking about that, because the power to print money and do what you will is power. And we see a lot of the, the, the ways that our federal government is getting outside their original role, the proper role of government, is because they can, through printing money, they can do more things. Mm -hmm. And it's my belief that if we curtail that money issue, that a lot of things will handle itself. It is certainly not the only thing that has to be handled, but it, is, it should not be a political issue. It's really a moral issue in that we're spending our children's <laughs> birthright, really. Right. Well, I mean, they need to because isn't it the government's responsibility to provide for all of us because we're obviously not capable of providing for ourselves. So they have to put in the roads and the schools and everything else. When uh, I can already hear the screams, right? <laughs> it, if we start talking about things like a balanced budget, then people jump to the idea of budget cuts and John sure. Boehner and other uh, people crying and, uh, and that kind of thing. Talk to us about how the budgeting process works a little bit at a high level currently and how it's different than our real life example of what a budget cut means and what this balanced budget amendment would do. Sure. Well, first of all, as we know, when they talk about budget cuts in Washington, they're not talking about cutting the budget. They're ta talking about cutting the, in the rapidity, you know, the growth of government down to a smaller level. Right. So we, we have not seen really a reduction in government in a long time. So what they're saying is, we were expecting to grow the government by 20% this year, and now we're only going to be able to grow up by 15. Right. That's where Woe the appear screaming and gnashing of teeth. Absolutely. And so what are you talking about? So what we're talking about, first of all, the, the compact itself is the vehicle teaching the states that you have the power to have a, a contract with each other to reign in the federal government. That in the end, the states are sovereign. They delegated certain powers to the federal government. And many state legislators, most do, but many don't know. Many citizens of each state don't know that we have this particular power. So we're trying to re-enfranchise people because many seem 
to feel disenfranchised. Oh, I can't make a difference there. Well, we can make a difference within our own state. Right. And we want to show the states that using a compact is one way that we can go and affect things that happen in Washington. And then the balanced budget amendment, of course, is really a moral issue. It's a moral question. And we think if we do that one particular amendment, that it will teach the states other things can come also. Right. Now, the compact, what we have with that is safety in, in the questions that many ask are how the, these things are going to happen, certainty about what the payload is, in this case, a balanced budget amendment, and speed, that this can happen pretty quickly. I mean, one to two years if it starts catching fire. And this is catching fire in many of the states. As a matter of fact, uh, we just passed through Mississippi, the lower and upper houses, uh, just passed this week, and now it all is only set to go to the governor. We've got, we're in 12 to 15 states right now at various levels of success, mm -hmm. but the compact commission itself is already formed between Alaska and Georgia. So we're starting to move in that in that particular direction. So you're getting inertia. Yes, sir. I mean, because it, it's an interesting kind of a thought process. I think many people would be surprised that have come into the understanding of politics over the last 20 years or so that the federal government is not supposed to be the one with all the power. It is supposed to be the states. And I think even our legislator, uh, legislators at a state level or even a more local level have become so reliant on the federal government, and many of them sure. aspire to end up there. Uh, how much education are you having to do for folks to teach them that the states are the ones that are supposed to have the power? Because they stopped reading the founding documents in many cases long ago. What's, sure. the, what's well, the learning curve? The learning curve, it, there is a learning curve, and there's a few reasons why people aren't signing on to this. One is a fear of a runaway convention, and the compact helps us have that certainty, safety, and speed. Uh, number two is fear of getting the, the trough taken away, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if, retribution. Mm -hmm. You know, that if we uh, are trying to rein in the federal government, are, you know, our state's going to get arbitrarily picked on over somebody else. And the third is really education. And I find that once I'm able to sit down and explain what we're trying to do, and that this should not be a partisan issue, it's a moral issue. Everybody understands we need to uh, balance our checkbook. As a matter of fact, the polls show about 70% of the people across the country agree that we have to balance the budget at some point. And, you know, um, I really like Thomas Paine's writings. You know, he talked about uh, breaking away from England, and he said, look, is an island going to always govern a continent? He said, it's not going to happen. It just cannot happen. So at some point, we have to take care of this. Now, are we going to man up, woman up, and do it? Or are we going to leave it to our children? Right. You know, the same comparison could go here. Uh, you know, we cannot continue on this road because there will be consequences. Mm -hmm. So are we going to tackle the task and do it in our time? Or are we going to leave it to our children to handle? Mm -hmm. So once we get into that, it really crosses partisan lines, and we have some hard work to do, and, and we need to sit down and, and get it done. Okay. So you talked a little bit about speed, mm -hmm. meaning that this could happen within a year to two years. It could. You've, you've touched on certainty and safety, but define those a little bit for us. Help us understand what, what people are concerned about fear-wise, and what does it mean if there's a runaway convention, and, and those safeguards that you're feeling are engineered in through this process. Sure. Well, let's go to certainty first. Certainty is, you know, who the delegates are, and those are the governors of the states, as per the compact. Now, the states can elect to choose up to three, and they can say, hey, it's the president of the Senate or leader in the House, you know, whatever they want to do. But at least we know who the delegates are. There's many people that are, hey, you know, what's going to happen, this kind of thing. We also know the duration of how long the convention would last. And in this case, it's only 24 hours. So it's very quick. You don't need to have a long drawn out. The contract is set ahead of time. Everybody knows the language. It's all the same. We have a congressional resolution that is going through Congress right now, uh, championed by Arizona Congressman Paul Gosar. Um, so all the rules are set forth. We'll have congressional support on this uh, when they sign off on that resolution. So there's no guessing on that. So that really has to do with the safety. And in that contract or compact that the state signs, it says what happens if you have a rogue governor saying, okay, now that we're all here, let's try to do this. Well, he's disqualified from being able to do any of those things. And that's signed by the state. 
So that takes on a safety and, and certainty aspect of what we're trying to do there. And so I think, do you think it's optimistic, 24 hours for people to get stuff done? <laughs> <laughs> well, in effect, since they're pre-ratifying this, so in other words, it takes 34 states to call a convention, but this convention is not called until 38 states sign on. And 38 states is three-fourths of the states, right. which is what we need to ratify an amendment to the Constitution. So we don't even have this convention until the states have pre-signed on. And the v convention really just becomes uh, something that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, you get there, the votes are tallied up. It's almost like the Electoral College you know, now it's, it, they don't, uh, actually, they don't, I don't, I can't, can't even remember if they meet anymore, but that's what kind of happens. You go, what, what happens is certain, and then it's kind of done. Goes back to the registrar in uh, Congress, and as soon as he sends it out, it would become law. Okay. So, in the, in the shorter term, in getting people geared up to, to get those 38 states signed on, is that part of what Compact for America does, is make sure that everyone's getting the same language, and of course there are going to be slight modifications based on the state or that kind of thing, but it has to be relatively similar language across the board. How do you get them to agree in the first place? Well, it, it is true, it has to be relatively similar language. We've had other states call for balanced budget amendments. Uh, and, and being close to having the 38 states. However, their calls have been a little bit different. Like we would want an uh, amendment to do this and another with that. So it, Congress could be confused about, well, is this really a call or not? With the compact, it is all the same language. That is correct. And they're educated on that. And the governor signs after the, uh, the, the two houses of each state, except for one. One has one uh, only unicameral. Uh, but the governor signs off and it becomes part of what they've agreed to. And how many thousands of pages does this take? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the neat thing about the compact is it does simplify the Article 5 process to really 50 legislative acts within the, uh, you know, the states are really two. You know, you have the, the, the House and the, the Senate, the upper and lower, so they're going to be signing it off. The governor signs it, and then really one uh, with the federal government as opposed to if you're going to a general convention, again, which I support, there's just a lot more legislative acts that have to happen. Right. So this simplifies it and streamlines it, and that, that helps with the speed yeah, aspect I, of this. I'm just, uh, I'm just wondering how confused politicians would be without thousands of pages of documentation <laughs> to, to analyze. <laughs> sure. And um, with no, I'm assuming there's no fat or pork that's uh, engineered into this piece of legislation No, either. there's, there's <laughs> not. And what's really neat about it is um, it has teeth that the federal government has to balance their budget. But what it, what it also supplies, and, and I wanted to mention, we have the endorsement of some really key people right now. Uh, George Will has endorsed us, hands down. Uh, Alan West has uh, Judge Napolitano on Fox News. Mm -hmm. uh, Grover Norquist. Uh, we're getting, when people understand what the compact's about and how it works and how it simplifies and answers questions, they get very excited. Uh, because if we can get something through, like a balanced budget amendment, which is the lowest hanging fruit, that or term limits, but right now we're focusing on balanced budget because we think that would do the greatest good in redistributing the power back from Washington to the states. Mm -hmm. So if we can get that through, it really opens the door for the states to start to regrow. Mm -hmm. You know, because the states are the parent. The federal government is really the offspring or the child. And those roles have been reversed yeah. in the last hundred plus years. So we're back to trying to teach that. Right. And so um, you'd mentioned teeth. What kind of teeth does it have? If they don't comply, they don't balance the budget, then what happens? Well, if the budget gets to be within 98% of the debt limit, then the president has to focus on impounds. And impounds being defined in the amendment, it's only a one-page amendment, and it's, it's very simplified over other balanced budget amendments that have been proposed. But if he doesn't do that, then that's an impeachable offense. He can recommend where the impounds go or the cuts go. That gets to go to Congress. So in the end, the president doesn't get to say so. And that's very important because we know the purse strings need to be controlled and handled by Congress. The president that's so makes old-fashioned, though. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just like freedom and liberty, right? right. Yeah, it's old-fashioned. Right. And so but now if we get up to 98%, they all get together and they all go on Fox News and MSNBC and they, they scream and cry in their respective corners. 
and then they say we really need to to uh, increase this debt limit or you or know we're going to uh, default yeah and old people are going to starve to death and the military is going to have to be fighting with marshmallow guns and yeah. i mean first of all that's all not true uh, but but how do you give them the intestinal fortitude we'll say to to actually do this or to threaten impeachment when they're so used to just signing their own credit increases sure well once we have a constitutional amendment passed in our age i mean this would be the first amendment in 23 years you know if it was done now uh, I believe there's a there's a natural law that which you sacrifice for you tend to love, mm -hmm. and so if the states got together and the people got together to do this and pass this budget and they didn't do this in Washington, I think there would be a lot to pay on their part. So mm -hmm. I think the the politicians in in Washington actually need the cover uh, to say, hey, I have to cut because we're under a constitutional amendment. Otherwise, they would have a hard time you know, uh, saying, hey, we can't do this, that, or the other. Right. But we have to tighten the belt. And I would rather pick the place for this fiscal plane to land, rather than all of a sudden the music stop mm -hmm. somewhere under unknown territory, and then we could have a serious crash. Right. And eventually, the one or the other is going to happen. Okay. And so, um, talk to me about what it is that that you guys are doing to reach out to these folks is there anything that our audience members can do to help bend the ears of politicians that you want to listen that kind of thing absolutely well you can go to our website uh, compactforamerica.org there's okay. a ton of information there right. if your audience has groups or people who want to be educated or have a speaker uh, you can contact us through compactforamerica.org okay. uh, and we go around the country uh, educating people uh, groups on all sides because again this should not be a partisan or political issue it's a moral issue mm -hmm. and that's the way we're going to win the fight here is is really for the next generation right. for the preservation of our republic okay. and so we that's how they can really help is get the word out and uh, support representative paul gosar in the u.s house of getting this resolution passed mm -hmm. uh, that basically would say hey once this compact is passed amongst the states right we've accepted to make the call as article 5 says they should okay and so just out of curiosity we've got a couple minutes left but a question that's kind of in my mind and you may not have the answer uh, are you uh seeing that you're getting better traction in states that have similar initiatives at a state level where they are required to try to balance their budget or is it just uh, the luck of the draw it, it works out one way or another depending on whose ear you get to bend well, I think there's been a real switch. You know, there's a lot of state legislators, uh, legislatures right now that are have become more conservative, have become more fiscally responsible because they've been through uh, the ups and downs, especially with the downturn right. that we've had over the last decade. And they've had to make the difficult calls and tighten the belt. And they have seen good results. I mean, Arizona's a great example. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, eight nine years ago I didn't understand how Arizona was going to make it through right but our legislators did it and it's really incredible so but it was really tough calls there were some hard things they caught a lot of arrows uh, but they were able to do it and okay. and and so we're having success a lot of success in just about all the states who who we've had a chance to get into okay excellent so if people have friends in other states where you haven't penetrated we're, yet make the we're open okay yeah. Excellent. Absolutely. So once again, if people want more information, they can go to? CompactForAmerica.org, and uh, we'd be happy to start a dialogue. Great. Well, Jeff, thank you for coming and sharing a little bit you about bet, what Chris. you're working on. Yeah. And uh, we'll be right back. Hold on just a second. We'll be right back after an underwriter, after a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Farm. The conservative forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. 
In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show, The Right Side, covering today's topics. Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. And then the left on. And that was a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. And we appreciate them tremendously because they, uh, in their underwriting of the show, they make this all possible and have now for about three years. But what they're really known for is their speaker series, which is the reason we were able to have Jeff on the show this evening. He'll be speaking this evening at 7 o'clock at 4.30 to Sterling Road at the Conservative Forum. Now normally on the second Tuesday of the month there will be all sorts of other speakers that come and often it's 300 to 500 conservatives that get together there at the Portuguese IFES Hall. In April on the 14th for example we'll have John J. Miller from Hillsdale. Uh, on May 12th Alan West, a name that's well known within conservative circles, uh, will be speaking. And on June 9th Catherine Engelbrecht uh, the founder of True the Vote. And so for more information on the Conservative Forum, you can go to theconservativeforum.com, get the schedule, and get more information on the upcoming speakers, fees, etc. for admission. But in closing, Jeff brings up a lot of interesting points, and one of the reasons that government has been allowed to run away the way that it has is many of us have lost touch with really the roles and responsibilities of government, and we've gotten beaten into submission to a point where we think there's nothing we can do about it. The reality is, if we get back to our roots, we learn about the powers that we have at a local level as well as a state level, we're much better positioned to know the mechanisms we have to defend ourselves, our families, our freedoms, and our liberties, and bring things back into a proper perspective. And so on that note, please do visit compactforamerica.org, learn more about Jeff and his organization, and keep up to speed with what they're working on, and who knows, maybe there might be a way that you can help. On that note, we appreciate tremendously you joining us this evening, and we'll look forward to seeing you again on the show or in person sometime soon. And if you just can't wait, reach out to us at the right side at TV at gmail.com. Thanks again. I've been Chris Pareja. This has been The Right Side, and have a great night.